Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for another EI Live K-12 session for students and educators. My name is Sherry, and this is the Make and Break ICE session at the Earth Institute. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Earth Institute, the core mission is to foster a greater understanding of the science behind climate change and sustainability and what we as global citizens can do. So experts that make up the Earth Institute include economists, business and policy experts, specialists in public health, and earth scientists. The Institute is made up of more than two dozen or so research centers and several hundred people who collaborate across many different departments and disciplines at Columbia University. What we're hoping to do with these EI Live K-12 sessions is to introduce you all to our interdisciplinary work through our scientific experts. We are going to have weekly sessions until the end of June, and if you'd like any information about the upcoming sessions, please do not uh, hesitate to contact me directly. So today we are very lucky to have Dr. Christine McCarthy with us from the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. She's going to be speaking to us about ice and how ice is found all throughout the solar system. Dr. McCarthy researches the physics of ice at different time scales and geological scales. And she'll be sharing some of the research she conducts at her lab at Lamont with us today. Um, and so the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory is the largest piece of the Earth Institute and the fundamental and basic science research within the Earth Institute is all based at Lamont. And it's a very important research entity that's a part of the Earth Institute at Columbia. And so we will have Christine share her presentation for us. And um, a reminder, uh, we will have questions at the end, um, and, but please feel free to use the Q&A box since the chat will be disabled throughout the presentation. So just throw your questions in there. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see that. Thank you so much for tuning in today and letting me uh, tell you a little bit about my research. Again, my name is Christine McCarthy. I'm a research scientist at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Um, and I'm gonna be telling you how I make and break ice in the lab. So as, she, as Sherry just described, there are a lot of different people in the Earth Institute. Um, at Lamont, uh, we have a lot of geologists or what she said, earth scientists. So geologists in general are folks who can um, study rocks to understand the earth and how it works. And, and geologists have lots of different specialties. Each one might specialize in say a different place in the earth or different process, um, maybe focusing on things that happened in the past, maybe thinking about what's happening now or trying to predict what's gonna happen in the future. Um, a lot of geologists can go into the field. They could sit and watch their volcano erupt or they can look at their outcrop. They could sit on the rock they can touch the rock with their hands. They can bring those rocks home. There are some geologists who will put those rocks in, into big machines and they will uh, squeeze them and slide them and break them and to try to understand how the rock behaves to try to understand the earth. These, um, this scientist is putting it in, um, in at say room temperature. You can also have machines that put really high temperatures and high pressures to re recreate conditions deep in the earth um, and, and they try to understand what's happening. So I'm also a geologist, but my rock of choice, my favorite rock is ice. Yes, ice is a rock. It's made up of lots of little crystals. And those crystals are minerals of ice. And you know, ice has a specific chemical formula. You know what that is, right? H2O. It also has a special crystal structure, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and although sometimes in our lab, we study ice that can be found on earth and, um, and maybe you can think about some of the ice that's that's found on Earth. If you were sitting in a room with me, I'd have you raise your hand and start yelling out things like uh, icebergs or uh, ice in my freezer, or maybe you'd say um, ice on the sidewalk in the wintertime, or maybe glaciers, and that's a big one. We do study glaciers in our lab, and if we wanted to, we possibly could go visit some glaciers and take some samples and bring them back to the lab. More realistically, we probably ask some of our glaciologist friends to bring some home for us. Um, so that's possible, but a lot of the work that we do in our lab is dealing with ice that's 
much farther afield, way, way out there, out in the cold stretches of the, of the solar system. Uh, for instance, this moon of Saturn, one of its moons, one you might say, how many moons does Saturn have? Saturn has 82 moons, crazy. This is just one of them, it's Enceladus. And um, it's a beautiful moon. Parts of it here, I don't know if you could see my little pointer, I hope you can. Um, this is showing craters. That means that part's kind of quiet, not really doing a lot. But down here at the bottom in the south polar region are these features called the tiger stripes, which um, are periodically um, squirting out, basically erupting geysers that are hundreds of kilometers tall of liquid water and gas and other chemicals that can be seen from far away. It's really, really exciting. And so these are the kind of features um, that we want to explore in the lab. But wait, you might be saying, wait, a I have so many questions. Before you get to your lab stuff, you might be asking, how do we know? How do we know that this is, there's ice on these moons in the outer solar system? Uh, how do we know what a moon is made of? Um, well, there are a couple ways. I'm gonna try to anticipate some of these questions and answer them along the way. Um, one of the ways that we know uh, what a moon is made of is by it, the way that it spins and orbits. So um, apparently uh, bodies that have um, all of the really heavy stuff inside the middle, like, the, like this cutaway of Ganymede, a moon of Jupiter shows, uh, if it has all of its heavy stuff on the inside, it's iron in the middle and then rock and then ice on the outside. Apparently scientists, scientists have known for a long time that it spins in a way that's different than for instance, just this um, kind of imaginary ball of rock that I've, I've put here. And this is actually an experiment that you can do at home. If you take two eggs, one of them is hard boiled and one of them is raw and you spin them, you could see that they spin in a different way. It's called moment of inertia. And that's how um, scientists know that, um, that this planet is what's called differentiated. So it's got its heavy stuff in the middle and it's light stuff on the outside. But you might be thinking, well, that just tells us that the light stuff's on the outside. How do we know that the light, and by light, I mean sort of low density. Um, how do we know that's ice? It could be anything, right? It could be cheese, maybe? No, it's not cheese. Uh, or it could be, uh, I don't know, it could be something else. Um, well, based on what we know, the, the kind of common elements, we know that hydrogen and oxygen are pretty common in our solar system. So it's a good guess that it would be ice, but we actually have a better way. We don't have to guess. We actually have what's called spectra. So for a long time, ever since the 70s, actually, we've been sending spacecraft out into the solar system. And these, um, these satellites have um, what are called spectrometers, among other really nice equipment. They have what are called spectrometers on the, um, the spacecraft. And what these do is they can detect the light from the sun bounces off the surface of these moons and, and then gets detected by the, the spectrometer. And it turns out when that happens, this sort of bouncing off, the, the signal that they get, the kind of squiggle, the wavelength that they get of the signal has to do with the stuff on the surface and what its crystal structure is like. Um, and so that's how we're able to identify the material on the surface. And it turns out after decades of sending out missions all over the solar system, that in addition to some small quantities of other kinds of salts and things that we might talk about a little bit later, uh, there's a lot of ice. There are a lot of icy bodies in our solar system, which is great for someone who studies ice, right? <laughs> it means I have lots of, lots of potential things to study. Um, Great, but there's something that's really exciting that I wanted to also point out here. And if you look over at the key here, we see that, um, that the ice is what is shown in white, but this is something kind of exciting. Water here is shown in blue, and there are a lot of icy moons in the solar system that are predicted to have a layer of water down below the outer ice layer. So a, a layer of water, a global ocean, actually, um, on the, a lot of these icy moons, not all of them, some of them. Now, this is crazy exciting. Why is this so exciting? Well, for a long time, scientists have been trying to understand or, or, or curious, kind of scratching their heads, wondering if there are other places uh, in the universe that might have life 
like we have here on earth. And so they've for a long time been thinking about kind of this zone, this zone around um, a central star or like our sun, um, where if you're too close, so, so one of the components to life is that you need liquid water. So if you're too close to the sun, um, all the water would evaporate, you wouldn't have any water too far, it'd be too cold and, um, and it would be solid. So there's been a long time they've, they've thought of this just right. They call it the Goldilocks zone, of course, right? Not too hot, not too cold. This zone that's just right um, as a place where you might find life. And there's also things that are important like having access to chemicals and importantly, an energy source. So in this case, it would be that sun. Um, so the exciting thing is that to find liquid water way past that habitable zone, way out here in the solar system and moons of, of Jupiter and moons of Saturn, that's pretty exciting because that tells us that maybe not just in other solar systems outside of the, um, of the in, in the universe, but here in our own solar system, maybe there's yet another habitable zone, maybe a new Goldilocks zone where liquid water is stable. Um, now there's still those other questions that we don't have an answer to. So this isn't a slam dunk. Um, we don't know about the chemicals and we don't know if there's a good energy source in such a situation. Um, uh, and so one thing that, that, that scientists consider, and this is just a cartoon, this is just someone's imagination here, um, that maybe on the bottom of these oceans, on the sea floor, there could be these kinds of sulfur vents. Um, and that would be kind of cool because there are those kinds of sulfur vents on the floor of the ocean here on earth. And those are known to be just teeming with life. They have little crabs and all kinds of different um, organisms that never get up to the surface to be in contact with the sun to get their energy. They get all the energy they need from the sulfur here on the seafloor from these vents. So that tells us if something, again, it's a big if, if something like this is on these, these other worlds that have ocean, um, there is the possibility that, that there is other life out there. So that's pretty exciting. So you know, humans were kind of a curious bunch, right? We want to explore, we want to know about that. So um, scientists are already beginning to think about, um, is it possible to send a mission way out to one of these icy moons, maybe land on the surface, maybe drill or melt your way through this big icy shell down to the ocean and send things around to look around and to see if there's, if there's life there. Now, when I say this, this is all way in the future, we're, we're thinking about it. But um, some scientists are actually already starting to kind of mock up, um, create technology that will get us there. So uh, one group that I know about is, is making, for instance, already making these probes that, that will drill, but also they will melt their way through the icy shell. And they're even, they've already built them and they're practicing. They're, they're doing some tests on in like Greenland or Antarctica, you know, ice here on earth to see if they'll, they'll work right. Um, but there's a big one major difference between the ice um, on earth and the ice in the outer solar system on these moons. And that's temperature, that's a big one. So on earth, all the ice you're gonna find is somewhere in the range, this is, a, this is degrees Celsius. It would be between zero, which is right at melting, um, down to maybe minus 40 at the coldest really where, where there is ice. Um, but the surfaces of these icy moons like Enceladus um, are significantly colder. They're down to like minus 160, minus 200, where ice behaves differently. And so in order to test these technologies and to, to really understand and prepare ourselves for um, what is out there and what is happening, well, that's where we come in. That's where the labs come in. We try to recreate those conditions. And so this brings us back to the question, but how do I get my samples? We obviously can't go and get a sample for me to make me test it. Um, so the answer is, of course, in the title, uh, we make them. And then you might say, well, that doesn't sound very fancy, Christine. I can make my own samples in the, of ice in my freezer, right? Well, it's not too far off. There are some similarities and some differences. So let me tell you about the similarities first. So 
the similarities between what I make in the lab and what you make in your ice cube tray is that the structure, believe it or not, is actually the same. So um, the structure, by what, what I mean by that is the way that the, the H and the O, the hydrogen and oxygen atoms are, are bonded together um, at sort of atmospheric pressure, at pressure here on the surface of Earth. Um, the form it likes to take, its happiest form is this what's called hexagonal. So it's, that's just based just by the shape. Look at it, it forms to make a nice little hexagon. And that's the reason that snowflakes are the, the way that they are and the shape they are. That's sort of the happy phase. But if you could imagine, um, just kind of as an aside, if you can imagine squeezing and having much higher, higher pressure on this, this structure of ice, this big openness in here, this kind of laciness of the ice, it's not happy, it's not a very stable, um, structure at really high pressures. So the, I, the H's and O's will reconfigure to another phase or what we call a polymorph of ice. And actually to date, I believe the last I checked, there are 19 known phases, known different structures of ice. Most of these phases are, are somewhat unrealistic and we would not be able to actually find ice in these conditions. They're really, really high pressure, made very special in the lab. Some of them are actually only theoretical made by computers, simulations. But so there are some moons, some really big moons in the outer solar system that deep at the bottom of like the really, really big shells, deep at the bottom, they might have some of these high pressure polymorphs of ice. But at the surface, what I'm talking about, that first layer of ice at the surface, it's actually, it's, it's actually either you know, this kind of pressure, atmosphere pressure or less. And the structure that's happy is, is for the most part hexagonal. So the ice that I'm making actually has the same structure as what you make in the lab. That's a long winded way to say that. But there are some differences. So we have found that, um, and, and by we, I mean just decades of, of people studying ice, that, um, uh, that the, the, the structure inside, the microscopic stuff really affects how it behaves, how it responds when we, we do tests on it. And, um, and so in particular, one thing that's really important is the size of the grains. So this is an individual grain of ice. A big chunk of ice has lots of little grains. This is called a grain boundary, the nice lines between. Um, and ideally for our experiments, we want something that we are striving that our, our results are what you call reproducible. That means that another lab can follow our exact steps and get the exact same results. This is what we want. And so we need to make sure that we're really systematic about what we do. So we need to make sure that in our samples, we control the grain size. We control how many bubbles there are because bubbles can affect the way that they deform. I did a really good job making this sample. I, I have to toot my own little horn. Um, there's only like one tiny bubble here. So this one was a really good sample. Um, also things like salts can affect um, the behavior of ice. And you know this very well, right? You, that's why we put ice on the sidewalk in the, in the middle of the winter to try to melt the, um, we put salt on the ice on the sidewalk to melt the ice. Um, so we know that having salts can affect the properties of ice. So we want to be very careful. So we, we um, have this, um, multi-step process of creating our ice samples. And we do it all in this nice walk-in freezer. This is just our freezer for all of our ice prep. And it's um, about minus uh, 13 degrees C, which is pretty cold. This is our field work. We don't go out into the field, we go into this cold room. And so we get suited up here. Dr. Yamauchi has her, um, her own suit on, her warm suit. And she's pointing out that it's, uh, it's pretty chilly in there. And so inside this walk-in freezer, we um, have a multi-step process to make our samples. So the first step is that we actually just make ice very similar to what you do in your ice cube tray. Uh, we're just putting, uh, we have really nice, clean, pure water, and we just freeze a big bulk of it. What we try to do is that the last little bit of water that has all the bubbles in it, we try to pour that out because what we really want is this really nice, beautiful, transparent ice. This is what they do when they do um, like ice sculptures. They, they make this kind of really pretty transparent ice. But then we take a saw and we, we break it up and then we put it in little chunks and we actually, believe it or not, put it in a food processor 
where we grind it up. We grind it up to about the texture of like sugar to flour, that kind of texture. Then we put it in this pile of sieves. So a sieve is kind of like a colander, like how you would um, drain the pasta uh, when, when out of the water um, when you're making pasta. Uh, and in this case, the sieve size, the, the mesh size gets smaller and smaller and smaller um, with each tray down. And, and what we wanna do then is to just choose the stuff that's in one tray. So it's kind of a uniform size of grains. And then we take that and we, we pack it in this dye or mold. And then I don't know if you can see in the background, I have a like an arbor press. So I squeeze down, I put it a couple layers, I squeeze down again, and then we um, pack it in this dye. We put the lid on it and the lid has um, two ports here. Those are a little bit bigger. I actually have a little baby version right here. <laughs> it's kind of cute. Um, what we do is we attach a vacuum to the top port. And so what we're doing is we're like sucking all the air out that's in between all the little grains just with a vacuum. And uh, we have on the other side, we attach uh, water and we, we close the valve. We put the whole thing in an ice bath. So it's sitting around at um, basically zero degrees. If you um, have a lot of ice and um, some water and you let it kind of sit for a little while and you took a thermometer, you would all, it would always be approximately zero degrees. And so at that temperature, um, ice and water are happy to be together. So we put this all in the bath and we, we've got the vacuum sucking the air out and then we open the valve to the water and that sucks the water into all of the little spaces in between grains. And then we quickly take that dye and we put it on a cold plate in our freezer and we leave it overnight and the whole thing um, crystallizes, oops. And then that's how we, well, if we took a little section of that and we looked on the microscope, we would see this. We would see that we have nice, beautiful, uniform grains all over the place and no bubbles. So this is our, our way that we make the samples. And what I didn't add to here, but if we wanted to say match some of the spectra that told us that they were non-ice things on some of these bodies, we could add, um, we can add in a very systematic way different salts to our sample too, to see how that would um, affect the response. Okay, so here is our, um, the main machine that we use in our lab. Um, this, that's a lot of stuff going on, but here in the middle is the apparatus and it's called a biaxial apparatus. So bi, just like bicycle, means two. So it's two axes of deformation. So there's a horizontal that squeezes together this way and then a vertical that pushes down in that direction. And all of that is controlled really carefully with the computers here. And the important thing for our research, since I told you that temperature is really important, um, is that we um, cool everything uh, very carefully. So we use liquid nitrogen that feeds into this big volume of circulating liquid that goes through these hoses, and it goes into our apparatus, and it goes right in little coils right next to our sample that sits in there. And, and then in this space around, we actually have a vacuum, which is a really good insulator. So that means that even though our sample is feeling minus 180 or so, um, that um, the outside is just room temperature, which is really nice because all of this electronics and, and frankly, the operators running the experiments like to be at room temperature. So let's talk about some of the tests that we do. The first test, uh, one of the tests is sliding. So um, this, this is called a friction experiment and you've actually all done friction experiments probably. We could do one right now actually. Why don't everyone slap your hands together. Hopefully you're actually doing this and not making me look silly and rub your hands together really fast, really fast. All right, and now you can feel heat, right? This is frictional heating. And so we're trying to explore that in the lab. And the reason we're doing that is uh, returning back to this beautiful moon Enceladus um, and those tiger stripes. One of the theories is that maybe frictional heating on those faults is what's creating the, the liquid and, um, and melt and causing it to erupt um, periodically. Uh, so that's something that that is one theory and we're studying that in the lab um, in order to do that. Yeah, when I say erupt, there's like a cartoon of showing the eruption from these tiger stripes, which can be seen from really far away. So basically we're trying to create a fault 
And this is Mahi Zaman, he's a grad student working on that right now. Here's kind of a little example. So we have these blocks. This is kind of to scale, actually. Um, and the machine, I told you, the horizontal will squeeze it together. Um, and then the vertical piston, the two side ones stay still, and the vertical piston pushes the middle down. And so what we're measuring is friction on these surfaces. And ultimately, what we like to know is if particularly if we add in other chemicals and stuff like that, what are the conditions that can create melt? And can this be a source of, um, of those plumes? We don't know, I don't have an answer for you yet because we just started on this. Um, he, this is his first year and he's working on this for his PhD. So we'll have to get back to you on that. Another kind of test that we do is called squeezing. So it's a creep experiment. So um, what we do is we just slowly, very slowly over time, maybe a couple of weeks actually, we will shorten a sample. And this would be a, a little bit warmer temperatures. And, um, and we, can, we can measure how that shortened that time, over time, the shortening, which is like with a little computer here. And so the way that it's deforming actually is this sort of stuff happening in microscopically. And I just think this is kind of interesting. I thought I would share about ice returning to that crystal structure and those hexagon hexagons. That actually the way that ice grows is that these, um, these hexagonal, we'll call them a ring, but the rings actually go on top of each other, kind of they flatten like this and they're like stacked. And um, when you, if it's oriented in the right direction and you're applying a, a stretch, you're kind of squeezing it, um, the, the, the rings act like almost like a deck of cards and they just sort of shear out along this one line. So there are old experiments where they took just a single big crystal of ice and they were actually almost like to stretch it out like silly putty because they're making all of these little, these little planes slide relative to one another. So I think that's kind of interesting. Um, the thing that we're measuring when we do these experiments is a word called viscosity. And maybe your parents have heard about this because they're trying to um, figure out which viscosity oil to put in the car. Higher viscosity means that it's um, sort of thicker and it, it takes longer to flow. So it's your viscosity is that how resistance to flow. And just to kind of give you a, a idea or like a scale, because sometimes it's hard to look at these numbers particularly the units, what is this Pascal seconds? That's kind of a weird unit. Um, but if we think over here on the, whoops, sorry, on the low viscosity side being water, you know, that flows easily. And then kind of thicker and thicker, we go to honey, say lava, um, bubble gum. That's something that you might have a, a tactile feeling for, cheese. And then there's kind of like a big jump over here, a big jump in numbers until you get to like warm ice that might be on our planet. Um, and then another jump to the really, really cold ice at the surface of these icy moons. But even that really, really cold hard ice is still much weaker than the whole range of viscosities of rock. So this would be a viscosity deep, deep in the earth. And just to remind you, when we have numbers like this down here, um, where we have say just 10 to the one versus 10 to the 25, it doesn't mean it's 25 times more it's actually 25 zeros. So it's just a huge number. This is just so much stronger, higher viscosity than something like this. Interestingly, uh, when we run classes to teach um, college people about, uh, about viscosity and about viscosity of rock and ice, we often will use this sort of a, a little baby creep rig that we bring to the, the classroom. And we often use cheese actually. We'll put a sample of cheese in there because it'll do all the same things but it'll do it in an hour versus weeks or decades or millennia. Okay, so moving on to the next thing, as in the title, I mentioned I was gonna talk about breaking. So returning also to uh, our goal of exploration and future missions, um, folks thinking about planning a mission that will you know, land on the surface and, and send a melt probe down through the icy shell. They're thinking like they should have the, the probe do some science while it's going down. They should, you know, maybe along the way sample the water and be looking for, for, for signs of life. And then they want to, um, you know, tell us what it found, you know, send the signal up to satellites that can, um, that can send the signal home. So we know what the probe is up to. 
but some scientists are really concerned that um, that I mean, so one possible way of doing that is to use a kind of um, a wire, basically, or a tether, um, very similar, a fiber optic table tether. I, sorry, a fiber optic cable, very similar to what I think is used for like um, phone lines and things like that. Um, but many scientists are really worried because there's so many faults and things like that. I told you maybe there's earthquakes that could happen or ice quakes that could happen. And they're really nervous that um, that might shear that tether. And then if it's sheared, then we'd lose all communication. It'd be a failure. So what we're doing in our lab is to try to help with that, to try to understand um, the strengths of ice versus um, versus faults. Sorry, the think the strength of tethers versus um, faults of ice. So uh, for this, we uh, created a whole different um, dye or mold for our samples. Um, shown here, kind of blown up, uh, where it's like a three quadrant dye. Um, and the exciting different thing is that it's got these things on the side, these um, so these tubes where we can wrap the tether around so we can get the tether nice and tight inside the dye. And then we just go ahead and do that same process I told you before about grinding and sieving and, and packing the ice. And so the resulting sample looks like this, where it's kind of one long piece with the three pieces of ice, they, they get a little fused together, they break apart in the rig, um, but in between is the tether, it's, it's embedded in the ice. And so our idea is to, um, it's the same kind of experiment, the sides are held up and we're gonna push down the middle and, and what we wanna see is what's gonna happen. Is the ice gonna shear that tether and break it? And so um, graduate student Vishal Singh was working on that. I should say he's not a student anymore. He just graduated. So Dr. Singh uh, was working on this project and he was looking at the whole temperature range that you might wanna um, have on one of these moons. So warm temperatures like you'd have deep down below close to the ocean and really cold temperatures like you would have on the surface. For those cold temperatures, he actually just added liquid nitrogen straight to it like he's doing right here. Um, and so the question was, it's just a battle. What's gonna win? Is it gonna be the ice or the tether? And I'm happy to report that tether wins. Even at the coldest temperatures, Vishal found that um, the ice would just explode and crash and break all over the place and the tether would stay intact. So this is pretty exciting. We still have other tests we want to run, things like um, stretching and pulling of the tether and, and other tests and torture things that we want to, to do to it. Um, but this is really promising news. And I hope that this means that this is some technology that can be used in the future on some of these missions. OK. So the last test I want to tell you about is probably if you read the description, you said, what? Tickling? What is that? So sometimes when we're running experiments, we, we don't want to break the ice up. We don't even want to you know, make it work like a deck of cards and, and sort of permanently deform. We just kind of want to non-destructively probe its properties, okay? So what we wanna do is kind of just a small, a little, a little squeeze and then we back off, a little squeeze and back off. And so um, it, if you're thinking about the squeeze is the stress, it looks like um, waves, hills and valleys, or the term for that is called a sine wave. And if you're thinking about what the sample is, is feeling, it, it, it looks like this. So even though the experiment, the technical term is called attenuation, um, those of us who do it actually call it tickling because it looks like what you would do to your friend to tickle. Um, anyway, you're probably going, okay, but why? Why do you want to tickle the ice? So let me tell you. So um, there's a thing called internal friction, so or, or tidal dissipation. That's what we're trying to study. So here's another experiment you can do at home with a grown up. Um, you can take a, a metal coat, coat hanger and you can bend it back and forth, back and forth. And if you feel the junction, oh yeah, it's hot. So what you've done is you've turned your mechanical energy, your muscles, into heat. And the way that you did that was by um, moving little defects inside the metal, little defects back and forth in that same way like this, but the little small defects were moving back and forth, creating heat. 
In the same way, scientists think that when these icy moons, here's a picture of, um, of not to scale of uh, Europa going around Jupiter, that, that um, you, you've maybe heard about tides and sort of the gravitational pull between big bodies and smaller bodies. Um, that makes kind of like a bulge that moves around during the orbit. And so if you were just some little packet of ice in the middle of the icy shell, that would kind of feel like as that bulge moved around and moved past you, it would kind of feel like this or like this kind of emotion over and over again throughout geologic time, torquing like this, basically moving little defects, whether that's in this case, the ice grains back and forth or those decks of cards those, those lines of cards moving back and forth, moving those defects, creating heat, and scientists think enough heat that that would be the reason why there's a liquid ocean. So that's the thing that we're trying to study in the laboratory. Pretty exciting. Okay, so I've, I've kind of thrown a lot of our science at you. Um, we do sliding and squeezing and breaking and tickling of ice and we do it all in the name of fun. I mean science. We do it all in the name of science and icy moon exploration. And um, if you think about it, some of these, um, some of these missions, like they, they will take a long time to plan. There's a lot of technology. These missions probably to go to these icy moons probably wouldn't happen for another 20, or 30 years. So it's you guys out there. You're the ones that are gonna be working on these missions. And I hope that the stuff that we're doing in the lab now were, will be useful to you in, in, your, in planning your mission in the future. And I, I hope that you've enjoyed listening to me talk about making and breaking ice. Um, whoops, here we go. And um, I hope that someday I might get to see you in in person every year, usually in October, um, when we're not in a pandemic, we have an open house at Lamont um, and uh, the rock mechanics lab. We always have some kind of a display that lets you squeeze and slide and break um, ice and rocks and things. Um, so I hope that you'll come join us and, and, and I hope that you will consider in the future maybe uh, doing some lab work. It's pretty fun um, and it's a, it's a great place to, to work. So thank you so much for listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. McCarthy. Um, we will uh, have somebody from NASA GIS uh, coming to, uh, Rosabel is actually here and uh, she will be sharing some resources for us and then we will um, answer any questions that anybody has. So Rosabel, feel free to share uh, those resources or your screen, I'll allow you to do that. Thank you, thank you. I am trying to share. Uh, it's not letting me share yet, I think, because it's still, yeah, thank you. Thank you, I think you can see my screen now. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, thank you again. My name is Rosalba Gerratano. I help support NASA's Office of STEM Engagement at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And I am grateful for the opportunity to share some supplemental resources today. I am going to add some links on the chat that correspond to the resources that I am sharing. So today I would like to highlight NASA Eclipse, Space Place, also a podcast named Gravity Assist, and also an augmented reality app called Explore Europa. So the first resource, NASA Eclipse, is a series of short videos. There is one series in particular that is called Our World. And so I am highlighting on the link that I sent you a specific video about what is ice. So here you can learn about some of water's very unique properties and what those properties mean to us and to our planet, so you will learn all the fundamentals about ice. The next resource is called Space Place. So this is a website that is designed for kids. It has tons of fun games, hands-on activities, articles, 
um, short videos as well. And it has a, spe a specific section that is called, is there ice on other planets? So on this presentation, we can learn about ice on our own moon, uh, also on other planets and also on other moons of other planets like Callisto, that is one of Jupiter's moons. Oh, and also I did want to highlight that this website is available in English and in Spanish. Next, um, there is this podcast named Gravity Assist. So if you listen to this podcast, you can join us as chief scientist, talking to leading experts in planetary science. So you can take pretty much a tour on the solar system and beyond. And so the link that I sent you is for one episode that is called Why Icy Moons Are So Juicy. And so on this episode, you can learn about um, mission called JUICE by the European Space Agency that will study Jupiter's icy moons, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto. And last but not least, there is this augmented reality app. Um, it's called Explore Europa. There are more. So it's a free app. You can take a journey on different places, an interactive tour of the asteroid belt, the moon, Mars, Saturn, Pluto, the one that I'm highlighting on the link is to explore the icy shell of Jupiter's moon Europa. So that should be a lot of fun. So I hope you check those resources out. And that's it for me today. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing those with us. And so um, I see we have some questions in the chat. And so um, we will go to that first one. Um, Emily has asked, what is inside the sun? Hi, Emily. Um, the sun, uh, like, like all stars, uh, is, is uh, gassy um, and it's um, made mostly of hydrogen, a little bit of helium, um, and they're at incredibly high temperature um, and pressures. And then we also have another one and it's about the sieves we were talking about. How do you sieve the ice to similar size pieces without melting from the mechanical sieving? Yeah, um, so the sieving would do, um, it, we just do shaking. So the mechanical is just us kind of. Um, and we also kind of brush, we use a brush actually because the shaking as it doesn't, isn't quite as effective. We actually kind of use a, a paintbrush and slowly brush um, the ice through the sieve. But I have to stress that we do all of this in the walk-in freezer. Certainly if we did any of this on the counter, uh, everything would melt. Um, and we, we, so we have the, the sieves live their life inside the freezer and we go in there and we, um, we go with this paintbrush, we kind of sieve, we try to move the ice around until everything smaller than that mesh falls through. And then all the big ones we kind of get rid of. And we do that over and over again. We make our way through. And, um, and we're really sort of being gentle and slow. And we're not, um, we're not really getting that kind of, uh, you know, I talked about sort of mechanical heat. We're really not putting too much mechanical energy into it. We're going very slow. So thank you. That's a good question. I didn't really explain that very well. Um, another question we have is, is there ice on the moon? On our moon, um, yeah. I mean, when I was younger, uh, they they used to think that there was just no no uh, water, no ice, or anything um, on the moon. If I was not mistaken, um, but I think they have, have realized uh, more recently that um, there is there's a lot more moisture around than they thought, and they do think that um, that like in the shadowy parts of craters, um, parts that never get exposed to the sun. Um, that that there could be little bits of ice, but um, but you know there's not much atmosphere, and like you know probably wants to sublim sublimate away, um, so it's just really small quantities. But I believe there there are some in the craters. Super neat. Um, we have one. It says, uh, "How long do your experiments take from Lincoln?" Oh, that's a good question too. Okay, it depends on what kind of experiment we're running. Um, the experiments that we're doing the um, the friction experiment and the braking experiment. So the sliding and braking, those aren't very long. 
um, because we're trying to kind of probe that sort of um, very fast, um, brittle kind of reaction. So those usually take about two hours. So um, I probably should have mentioned that the, to make a sample, that pretty much took a scientist all day and then it, it freezes overnight. And so the sample will be ready to use the next day. But then um, the, the machine will have to get to temperature and get prepped and ready. Um, and so that'll kind of be all morning long. They load the sample, everything gets to the right temperature and then they run the experiment and it takes about two to three hours depending on the, the program that they have written. Um, but then they remove the sample, put it in the freezer and then they could go home. Um, those squeezing experiments, um, I told you about, well, those actually take a really long time. I worked on some of those during my PhD and those would take about two to three weeks um, because we would try to go really, really slow rates, trying to, to understand like deformation. I'm sorry, like the, that's the deformation means like the, the, the shortening that the, happens with the ice, trying to understand things that happen really slowly. So um, we would let those go for a long time. And the tickling experiments, um, those last anywhere from like a day to three days. And then we have one last question. Um, Alistair would like to ask, how does ice melt? Yeah, um, um, right. So I like to, the way I think about it is, is going back to imagining that, um, remember that little hexagonal ring that I showed you? That's the crystal structure of the solid. Um, you know, so you've got your, your, your uh, H's and your O's uh, attached and bound to each other. Well, all, all atoms, not just hydrogen and oxygen, all atoms that make up all material, they kind of, um, they vibrate with temperature. So such that like at zero K, that's kind of a, a hypothetical no temperature, like the lowest, lowest temperature, everything is still. But the higher the temperature, the more they vibrate. And so you've got these, these, these atoms that are on a, a kind of solid crystal lattice, they're gonna get to some temperature and it's prescribed by that, that lattice and that material that the, the, the oscillation is so much that so the bonds start breaking and they just start escaping from one another and jumbling around and they're not in their structure anymore. And that is the melting temperature for that material. So um, every material has a different melting temperature when those atoms just can't take it anymore and then they break apart. So that's what melting is. And it comes on slowly from like sort of the outside, those start breaking off and then, then that's why it kind of melts from the outside first and it, it makes its way into the side. So hopefully that answers the question. Yes. Um, and so uh, we do have just one more, and I think that'll be our last one because we're running out of time. It's, is there something about ice that most people understand wrongly or is it counterintuitive? Um, well, I mean, I think most people know this, but I think sometimes it's kind of a strange thing um, for people to understand is that in, in all other, just about all other materials, um, the solid form is denser and will sink than the liquid form. Uh, ice is really unique in that that hexagonal structure is actually more open, less dense than the liquid form, which allows the atoms to get a little bit closer to one another. So, um, so it, ice is pretty unique, really, in the world in that the solid form is buoyant. It is less dense than the liquid form, and that's why it floats, and it's really important um, for life as we know it. <laughs> you know, if the, if the ice sunk and, the, and would be on the bottom of lakes, then all the fish would be flopping around on top, and it wouldn't be a good thing. Um, so uh, so that, I don't know if that's necessarily your question. Um, I think that I found when I talk to people and I explain that um, it has crystal structures and that it's a rock and it's a mineral and things like that, that kind of blows people's mind. And um, uh, so, so maybe that would be sort of a thing that people aren't aware of. Well, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us and answering all of our questions, um, and especially for having such great visuals to help us, you know, in this online format, see what you are talking about. That was really wonderful. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, 
a, this recording uh, will be shared on the Earth Institute website. Um, and anybody who had RSVP'd to this event, you also be getting an email with that link and a link to some resources. And we would like to thank you all for coming to tune in. Um, the schedule for future EI Live um, will also be on the Earth Institute website as well. So thank you so much to Dr. McCarthy and Rose Alba uh, for coming and speaking and thank you all for tuning in. Thanks so much, everyone.